This lovable nerd took us on so many adventures filled with laughter and sometimes beer. Seeing Rick Moranis on the silver screen brings levels of cinematic comfort that nobody's nostalgia can come close to. You can really feel his presence. He reminds you of like an unthreatening Sunday school teacher or somebody's nerdy dad who may not necessarily be able to single-handedly fight off an army of killer monsters to save the world, but you know that Rick Moranis will do whatever it takes to protect his family, on and off the screen. He is in most of our childhood favorites, or adulthood favorites, depending on how old you are. But it does feel like forever since we have seen his face on film. And you know what? It has been forever. And that is why you have a hole full of sadness in your heart. A Rick Moranis shaped hole. Movies haven't really been the same without everybody's favorite dork. So why did his professional artistic output come to an almost complete stop? How could one man walk away from it all? But mostly we just want to know, what the f happened to Rick Moranis? You'll bleep this out. I have a tendency to use some words. Don't, you know what don't I'm worry, we can clean it up. In okay, the Stephen, I need a cigarette. My guest today is my brother, Doug McKenzie. And, How are you? Uh, he's, Good day. He's like an expert, right, on long underwear. That's right. Because he, like, dirties them <laughs> so much. <laughs> okay, no, seriously, though. But to truly understand what the f*** happened to Rick Moranis, we must start at the beginning and the beginning began when he was born on his birthday. 1953, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Young Rick Moranis would begin entertaining the world as a funny man radio DJ who soon got noticed in no time and was invited to join the third season of the famed Improv Theater's Second City Television where the beautiful, hilarious comedy of Rick Moranis would thrive. Rick Moranis and his buddy Dave Thomas were asked to create a two-minute sketch that had, quote, identifiable Canadian content. And the sketch they created featured the characters Bob and Doug McKenzie. And these characters became so popular that in no time they were featuring a Bob and Doug McKenzie sketch in every episode. And of course, this brought on some hilarious comedy albums that will tickle your funny bone through your ear holes. And when you create a monster that becomes that popular, there is only one thing to do, create a movie. So Rick Moranis and Dave Thomas took the characters and co-wrote and co-directed as well as co-starred in the now cult classic, The Adventures of Bob and Doug McKenzie, Strange Brew. Okay. Uh, oh, nice going, you knob. Hey, what kind of movie is this? Uh. And this silly little movie, it received mostly positive reviews, with critics saying that this was a movie where you knew exactly what you were in for, and it did not disappoint on that front. And yeah, this one gets pretty wacky and out of control and, uh, you know, just downright silly. And it's beautiful. This movie pulled in two times its budget at the box office and has gone on to become a classic. A comedy classic. A Canadian comedy classic. A cult Canadian comedy classic. Hey, did you ever notice that, uh, like, in movies that they, when they're driving, like, they don't look at the road? Like, for a long time? Geez, no, I, I never noticed that. Yeah, that's because, uh, they're being towed, eh? Really? By, like, Rick. That's... Rick Moranis would follow up Strange Brew with an unexpected turn in the Walter Hill-directed musical, Streets of Fire. This film would go on to underperform at the box office with only $8 million on a $14 million budget. And those critics, they found the film overly ambitious, but they appreciated the visual style and the incredible cast. And of course, this one did go on to become a cult classic because, you know, a Rick Moranis movie, and Rick Moranis is a wonderful addition to this bizarre flick. McCoy, can't you drive this car any faster? I don't want any bombers sneaking up on us. Let's get our asses out of here real quick. By this point, Moranis was already pretty much Canadian comedy royalty, but it was one movie released in 1984 that brought Rick Moranis to the attention of the rest of the world 
and beyond. Ghostbusters. And this movie right here opened our eyes to what a movie could be. And of course, Ghostbusters has an iconic, amazing cast. And this movie truly lived or died by its supporting cast. People like Annie Potts, Sigourney Weaver, and without question, Rick Moranis. Ghostbusters would have been really, really good, but Rick Moranis, he pushed it over to great, beyond great. Many of the aspects of this beloved character were Moranis bred. They came straight from his head, from his noggin, his own ideas. And of course, this movie right here is Rick Moranis' highest grossing domestic release with a take of over 242 million in North America and nearly 300 million worldwide. So you want your movie to be good? Who are you gonna call? Well, you know, you should probably call Rick Moranis. Does anybody want to play for cheesy? Okay, who brought the dog? Then he would reunite with his Streets of Fire director, Walter Hill, for a Richard Pryor, John Candy comedy called Brewster's Millions. This movie received mixed reviews with most people saying that they expected it to be funnier because of the funny people involved. He would follow that up with Head Office, but this one only managed to make three million. It sounds like a lot of money if you don't have three million dollars, but it's actually, it's not a lot of money when you're dealing with these Hollywood fat cats. Moranis would kick off the year 1986 by appearing in the Harold Ramis-directed flick, Club Paradise. So my uncle and I are going down to the uh, islands for a couple of weeks. You want to come with us? Critics said that the film had some funny parts, but not enough to sustain its 104-minute runtime, and it only made $12 million off a $15 million budget. But it's not how you start the year 1986, it's how you finish the year 1986. And Rick Moranis would finish that year of 1986 off strong by starring in the big screen adaptation of the Broadway play, Little Shop of Horrors. Critics called the film a winning musical, and Roger Ebert, the guy with the thumbs, said that this was the type of movie that cults are made of. Are you in this cult? Little Shop of Horrors cost a reported $25 million and pulled in $39 million at the box office, which made the studio call this one an underperformer. However, this killer plant would eventually take over the world on home video. Suddenly see more. Then came the year 1987 and Rick Moranis' sole output of that year was, for my money, one of the greatest parody films ever made. Mel Brooks's Spaceballs. Rick Moranis would play the villain in the film, Lord Dark Helmet, and he would deliver some of the funniest lines in the entire movie. He stole the show. Spaceballs pulled in 38 million off a 22 million dollar budget and received lukewarm reviews, with most critics finding it funny but saying it missed the mark, being released 10 years after Star Wars. But of course, this was another misunderstood classic and has gone on to become one of the most beloved comedies in the galaxy. Everybody got that? Good! Then came the year 1989, and that was a pretty massive one for Moranis. He would return to the world of busting, Ghost, for the paranormal sequel Ghostbusters 2. This sequel would go on to make 215.4 million worldwide. But critics were not fond of the second Ghostbusters, saying that it lacked the charm of the original. And it appears that Rick Moranis was offered a role in the new, new Ghostbusters, but he declined to return. Ah, nuts. <laughs> then came Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and Moranis would launch another iconic franchise, appearing as everybody's favorite amateur inventor, or not-so-mad scientist. And in this one, he hilariously shrinks his children. The original title for this movie was called Teeny Weenies, and this was actually written as a Chevy Chase project, but he couldn't do it because he was on vacation. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids would go on to earn almost $223 million at the box office, off an $18 million budget. 
Critics were very warm to the film, calling it a winning family adventure. Rick Moranis would then finish 1989 off by starring in a hit dramedy, Parenthood, opposite Steve Martin. And this film was a huge hit, pulling in 126 million and earned strong reviews, calling the film thoughtful and very funny with a delightful cast. And of course, Rick Moranis was part of that delightful cast, and he made it just a little more delightful. Then came the movie My Blue Heaven, about the famed mobster Henry Hill. So it's literally the same story as Goodfellas, but with a different type of sense of humor. My Blue Heaven received so-so reviews, calling it a great concept with disappointing execution. He would also lend his vocals to an animated series called Gravedale High, playing the only human at a high school filled with vampires, werewolves, and mummies, and Frankensteins. Frankenstein's monsters. The series only lasted a lucky 13 episodes. Well, glad you could join us, Gil. Now, let's continue our discussion on what we all want to be when we grow up. Then came the year 1991, and this year sadly would be full of tragedy for this legendary comedian. His wife passed away of cancer in February of that year. And from that moment, Moranis would make the decision to slow down his professional life, to focus not only on grieving, but raising his family. In 1992, he would reverse course and blow up his kid. Not like Kaboom, but like as in Giant. And this film was not originally a sequel to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Instead, it was titled Big Baby. And this Big Baby would make 96 million at the box office. Reviews for this sequel were pretty negative, with most calling it a one-joke premise stretched out too long, or blown up. But in 1992, I loved this flick. So I don't know what those haters are talking about. In 1993, we would see Rick Moranis appear in the Eric Idle movie, Splitting Airs. Get it? Box office numbers for this one don't seem to be readily available to the, to the public. They seem to be top secret. However, according to Wikipedia, the film performed poorly. And everything on Wikipedia is 100% true, you guys. First up in the year 1994 AD, Anno Domini, was the big screen take on The Flintstones, where Rick Moranis would play Barney Rubble, opposite John Goodman's Fred Flintstone. Now I know that this movie got lambasted when it was released, and it's not exactly looked upon as a classic by today's standards, but 1994 me loved this flick. So there. This film was released May 27th, 1994 to some not great reviews. Critics actually really liked the effects of the Flintstones, and yeah, it looks interesting, it looks great. But the story does fall flat. But that didn't stop families from eating this one up. And to this day, The Flintstones is Rick Moranis' highest grossing film worldwide making over $341 million. The second unofficial classic film that Rick Moranis made in 1994, A.D. Anno Domini, is, for my money, one of the greatest football films ever made, Little Giants. This is one of those mid-90s kids underdog sports movies that they just don't seem to make anymore. This genre right here is a, is a true lost art. This film received mixed reviews. Many people appreciated the underdog story, but a lot of those critics found the humor to be juvenile. Yes, a kid's movie where the humor is juvenile. Can you believe it? I have first-hand experience. I played peewee football in the mid-90s. And these little giants right here, they captured the true spirit and tone of that environment perfectly. Rick Moranis would finish 1994, not in movie theaters, but in amusement parks, with Honey, I Shrunk the Audience. 
This right here is an amazing 4D ride that cuts you, the audience, down to size. Minuscule size. Teeny weeny. And I remember going on this ride when I was younger and I absolutely loved it. I loved the 3D screen, I loved the 4D smells and, and feels. It's just a great amusement park experience. And the Honey I Shrunk the Kids franchise? Yeah, it's perfect ride material. Is this one still around though? In the year 1996, we would see Rick Moranis' final appearance in a theatrically released live action film. And that film is the classic pairing of Rick Moranis and Tom Arnold in Big Bully. And this film has a rare 0% on those tomatoes that are rotten.com. But we all know that tomatoes can't be trusted. And Big Bully would be a huge box office bomb, pulling in just $2 million off a $15 million budget. The next year, 1997, would see Rick Moranis return to the world of shrinking people by appearing in the direct-to-video sequel, Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves, where this time, the adults get down. This was actually Disney's first ever live-action direct-to-video film. So there's that. And as of today, this is Rick Moranis' final live-action role. Those pesky critics did not enjoy this one, though, calling it stale and boring. But 1997 me loved watching this adventure over and over and over on that Disney Channel. And since this film, there was a Honey, I Shrunk the Kids TV series, minus Rick Moranis, but there may be some good news on the horizon when it comes to the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids franchise. Disney picked up a pitch by Josh Gad for a new film titled Shrunk, which would see Rick Moranis return to the franchise. And Shrunk was set to be shot in the year 2020. But for some reason, I don't know why, that, that just didn't happen in the year 2020. Yeah, you know, the, the world had other plans when they decided to shut it down, and they put this one on the back burner. And there are rumors that they'll get back to filming this one in 2022. Oh yeah, and he had some wonderful appearances on Muppets Tonight. And like we all know, since the death of his wife, Rick Moranis had taken a step back from the public eye. Understandably so. But in 1997, he finally addressed the issue by saying, quote, I'm a single parent, and I just found that it's too difficult to manage to raise my kids and to do the traveling involved in making movies. So I took a little bit of a break, and that little bit of a break turned into a longer break. And then I found that I really didn't miss it. And nobody can blame you, Rick. You did the right thing. And we will forever have respect for the decision you made. A true hero who did the right thing. Although Rick Moranis retired from live action filmmaking, he would still lend his vocals to the occasional animated project, like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and the Island of Misfit Toys. Also, he would lend his voice to the Disney hit animated film, Brother Bear, opposite his strange brew partner, Dave Thomas, as a pair of Canadian mooses. Meese? Meeses? Moose? Is, is moose just the plural for moose? Well, whatever it is, these animated animals, frickin' hilarious. Whoever had the idea to cast these two Canadians, you know, they, they, sh they should get a raise or something. But Brother Bear received mixed reviews from those pesky critics. However, everybody loved the comic relief of Moranis and Thomas. And yeah, this one made a hefty $250 million at the box office. And even though he was stepping away from movies, he was still, you know, doing his thing, expressing himself comedically and artistically. In 2006, Moranis would receive a Grammy nomination for Best Comedy Album. And since then, he's kind of kept, you know, a low profile. From time to time, you'll see him pop up in something, like a 2007 Bob and Doug McKenzie TV anniversary special. And he would executive produce an animated series 
of Bob and Doug. However, he would not provide the voice, because, you know, he was retired from that acting stuff. Instead, they would have Full House's Dave Coulier provide the voice, because Uncle Joey can do anything and everything. The series lasted two seasons with 15 episodes. Then he would kind of just, you know, do his thing, live a normal life, raising kids. Oh, but in the year 2020, you know, uh, uh, that, that, that one year, Moranis would pop up in an episode of the Disney Plus series Prop Culture, where they discussed the props of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Also in that year, 2020, Moranis would pop up in a Mint Mobile commercial opposite Ryan Reynolds. And you know what? Rick Moranis should totally be in a Deadpool movie. Like, I'm just saying. Do it. That's it? That's it. And then, as if that year 2020 wasn't bad enough already, and our faith in humanity wasn't already at an all-time low, on October 1st, 2020, some absolute piece of garbage trash walked up to Rick Moranis, who was just walking on a sidewalk minding his own business, and punched him in the face. Like that horrible fucking knockout game. Moranis suffered injuries to his head, back, and hip. The security footage made its way online and invoked outrage by all of us who grew up with this legend. And that cowardly criminal was eventually caught. Assaulting an innocent person for no reason is evil enough. But when that person is Rick motherfucking Moranis? My god, that's crossing the line. Nobody, not nobody touches our pal Rick, you hear? It took a month and a half, but there has been an arrest in the assault of actor Rick Moranis. Rick Moranis is a legend, plain and simple. This scrawny little dude came out of nowhere and took the comedy world by storm, creating memorable characters that have stood the test of time. Sadly, tragedy befell him early on which saw him take a step back from the limelight in order to focus on his family. But even with a reduced output, his legendary status still survives. I'm a little partial to the Rick Moranis cup. What do you think? Does it look like me? Collect all three cups, only at McDonald's. So thanks for all the laughs. Thanks for all the films. And thanks for making it cool to be a little nerdy. So you know what, Mr. Moranis? You do not need to be walking alone down a dark, creepy sidewalk. You have millions of supporters out there who totally got your back and would never let anything bad happen to you. We promise. So nobody should give a fuck about what the fuck happened to Rick Moranis because he's doing just fine. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. Everybody's favorite teenager uttered those words back in 1986, and ever since then, Matthew Broderick has been a household name. He started out on the stage and found his way onto the big screen, and then back on the stage, then the big screen again, and some TV too. And then back to the stage again. Many producers in Hollywood tried their hardest to mutate this theater nerd into a blockbusting, big-time, kaiju-sized, mega-movie star leading man. But he never quite reached that status. But why? Why did this king of the jungle run away from his throne? Was Ferris growing up just too much for society to handle, like Peter Pan leaving Neverland? Did his involvement in a tragedy interfere with his career? Did his box office intake disappoint the pockets of those producers? Or did he find his way back to where he truly excels? The stage. Wowzers. So I vote that we discuss the ups and downs and downs and ups of the life and career of Matthew Broderick. And since my vote matters in this absolutely perfectly safe, unriggable election, that means that it's actually gonna happen. Like, right now. Well, after I ask the question. And that question is... What the f*** happened to Matthew Broderick? Ow! Ow! Jesus! Oh, fuck! 
Before we begin, I just want to say thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe, and click that bell to get those notifications if you enjoy this type of content on the YouTubes. Tell your friends and your family, if you have any. Now it's time to get back to the show! But to truly understand what the f*** happened to Matthew Broderick, we must begin at the beginning, and the beginning began when he was born on his birthday! Manhattan, New York, 1962. After making waves with stellar reviews and many off-Broadway plays, young Matthew would move on up to the big show, starring in Neil Simon's semi-autobiographical 1983 Broadway play Brighton Beach Memoirs, where he would end up winning a Tony Award for Best Performance by a Featured Actor in a Play at just 21 years old making him, still to this day, the youngest person to ever receive that Tony Award. Only I was born Italian. All the best Yankees are Italian. My mother makes spaghetti with ketchup. What chance do I have? <laughs> Broderick would reprise the role for the play's 1985 sequel, Biloxi Blues, as well as star in the big screen adaptation of that, directed by the legendary Mike Nichols in 1988. With Broderick making a name for himself on Broadway, it was only a matter of time before Hollywood came a-calling. Already being familiar with the dialogue of Neil Simon, Matthew was able to make the easy transition to the big screen, with the Neil Simon-penned 1983 film Max Dugan Returns, that Roger Ebert, the guy with the thumbs, called watchable. But Broderick's true breakout would be in the 1983 thriller, War Games. You know what that means, David? No, what does that mean? World War III. This film originally had a much more darker take on the material of war, but the original director was fired just 12 days into production and a new director came in, which made the cast very scared because they thought they were going to be fired next which I guess added to the whole paranoia vibe of the film. But yeah, War Games, it went on to become a classic. This is a very suspenseful Cold War film. And on just a $12 million budget, it made $124.6 million. Give Matthew Broderick's character a computer and he can do anything. How about a nice game of chess? After being miscast as a 13th century French thief, in Richard Donner's 1985 fantasy cult film Lady Hawk, which was a box office disappointment, Matthew would then appear in one of the greatest 80s teen comedies ever made. No, one of the greatest teen comedies ever made. No, one of the greatest comedies ever made. No, one of the greatest movies ever made. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. John Hughes wrote the script with Matthew Broderick in mind, saying that he was the only actor he could picture in the role. Because, you know, he was clever and charming. And even though Ferris Bueller basically abuses his best friend Cameron, he's still likable for some reason. Only Matthew could pull that off. Critics would call the film a sweet, warm-hearted comedy, with some saying that the performances in the film were Oscar-worthy. On its small $5 million budget, Ferris Bueller was able to rack up over $70 million and became a true classic, even being selected for preservation in the National Film Registry at the Library of Congress in 2014. And of course, he would reprise his role in a Super Bowl commercial. This is the perfect character for Matthew to play. It was like everything he had done was building up to this character. He's got a computer like in War Games, and he breaks the fourth wall like it's a Neil Simon play. He was born to play Ferris. Never had one lesson. After making Ferris Bueller, Matthew Broderick and his on-screen sister Jennifer Grey began dating in secrecy. However, that secret became public knowledge when on the evening of August 5th, 1987, Matthew and Jennifer were driving in North Ireland when their car veered into the wrong lane, causing a head-on collision with another vehicle that sadly killed the mother and daughter driving in the other car. Matthew Broderick only recalls waking up in the hospital with no memory of the accident or how his car veered into the other lane. At the crash site, Matthew was reported to have said, Did I hurt them? Did I hurt them? Over and over. He was originally going to be charged with causing death by dangerous driving, with a possible five years in prison. 
but was ultimately convicted of lesser charges of careless driving after it was determined that he was not intoxicated at the time of the crash, and he was fined basically the equivalent of $175, which outraged many people. They did not feel like justice had been served. Matthew would need many years of therapy to come to terms with this tragedy, and the family members of the women lost have apparently forgiven the actor, even though it took quite a few years. This was a truly horrible, horrible accident, a tragedy that goes to show that, you know, life is precious and this kind of stuff can happen to anyone. Matthew had survived, but he was unconscious and had amnesia and was very badly injured. And I thought he was dead and I didn't even know there were two other women who were tragically killed. The year 1987 would also see Matthew Broderick star in Project X alongside a chimpanzee. The film pulled in middle-of-the-road reviews. It's just one of those nice monkey-boy friendship movies, but, you know, the Air Force is involved this time. Yet, Project X was only able to pull in $21 million off an $18 million budget. And that's without considering the ever-important marketing budget factored in. So yeah, it lost a lot of money, which I bet drove the producers bananas. Sorry. And Bob Barker himself, yes, that one, launched accusations of animal cruelty. And we're not sure whether or not they were actually cruel to the animals, but it did cast a dark shadow over Project X, even though it's a fun movie. Because, you know, monkeys. Matthew Broderick, Project X. Then Matthew Broderick would really move up to the big leagues in terms of cinema. First with a role in Sidney Lumet's $12 million grossing Family Business in 1989 opposite Sean Connery and Dustin Hoffman. And Matthew could hold his own amongst those acting titans, so yeah, that says something. But sadly, Family Business proved to be a failure on all fronts, with critics saying that these three actors did their best with what they had to work with. But Broderick's second film of 1989 would prove to be a bit more successful when he helped Denzel Washington land his first Oscar for the $27 million grossing Glory. Probably one of, if not the best Civil War movie ever made. American Civil War, in case you were wondering which Civil War, because there's so many wars out there that are civil. Matthew Broderick would play True Life Union Colonel Robert Shaw. And at the time, Glory was criticized for casting Ferris Bueller as a Civil War soldier. People didn't think Matthew had that type of range, didn't think he had it in him. But allegedly, Matthew is distantly related, a descendant, of the real Colonel Shaw. So yeah, this character is in his blood. It's kind of perfect casting, actually. And his innocent Ferris face, it actually works in glory. It creates a heartbreaking contrast to what surrounds him, you know, the horrors of war. And it makes those horrors of war even more horrible. And yeah, Denzel Washington deserves all the praise, of course. Morgan Freeman too. Everybody. But Matthew Broderick really showed us something different. He surprised us all. And it was absolutely glorious. Nineteen ninety would see Matthew star opposite the man that many consider the greatest to ever do it, Marlon Brando, in the twenty one point five million dollar grossing comedy The Freshman, with critics giving particular praise to Matthew Broderick's performance. Once again, he was called charming. I think Dick Cavett said it best. He said that there are two groups of actors, those who have worked with Brando and those who haven't. I guess you can say that about anyone and anything, but with Brando, it actually feels like it means something. After appearing in back-to-back -back box office bombs with a $1.6 million grossing out on a limb in 1992, and the slightly better $1.9 million grossing The Night We Never Met in 1993, Matthew Broderick would bounce back with the biggest hit of his career, The 900. $68.5 million grossing animated juggernaut, The Lion King. Where he would voice adult Simba, 
grown-up JTT. From the beginning, the filmmakers knew that Matthew had the perfect voice for this furry king, which is why Matthew was the first actor cast. Critics could see that this film was an instant classic, and as the years have gone by, that's exactly what it turned out to be. Matthew would reprise his voice as adult Simba in the film's direct-to-video sequels, 1998 The Lion King 2 Simba's Pride, and 2004's The Lion King 1 and a Half. But he was replaced by Childish Gambino in the not-live-action live-action remake that totally sucked and reminded us how amazing the animated film truly is. Matthew would finish up 1994 with the Palme de Tour nominated Mrs. Parker and the Vicious Circle, and the highly underrated film The Road to Wellville. This flick is hilarious and absolutely insane. If you like that kind of stuff. In 1996, Matthew Broderick would perfectly play the straight guy, opposite Jim Carrey, truly allowing him to go wacky wacky cuckoo, in The Cable Guy. And yes, Jim Carrey is hilarious in this one, but the true comedy comes from Matthew's reactions. Just look at those reactions. And you know what? Acting is reacting. <laughs> I'm just jerking your chin. <laughs> Despite the cable guy pulling in over $102 million off a $47 million budget, this film was considered a box office disappointment because at the time Jim Carrey was at the top of his game, and a film starring him was meant to do much, much better, better, more business stuff. Money. It should have made more. Which pissed off those producers. The Cable Guy actually has a darker tone than most people were expecting, which really threw a lot of critics and the audience off. Some couldn't get past it. They called it bizarre and creepy. But yeah, that's the f***ing point. Of course, in the years since the release of The Cable Guy, it has become a true cult classic and has finally earned the respect it deserves decades later. Oh! Oh! What the hell is wrong with you, man? After dipping his toe into directing and producing, a film called Infinity, it made less than $200,000, and it was written by his mother, he would also appear opposite Meg Ryan in the $34.7 million grossing Addicted to Love in 1997. But then Matthew would give the big summer tentpole a chance by appearing in Roland Emmerich's reimagined Godzilla. In 1998, this film was not championed by those pesky critics, who said that in order to enjoy the film, you must repress any intelligent thought, which is probably why I loved it so much in 1998. But yeah, this is a big mess of a movie that doesn't really make any sense. But you know, just take your brain out and you'll have some fun. Even though it's like totally like disrespectful to the legacy and mythos of Godzilla. This movie was expected to open to over $100 million domestically during its Memorial Day opening weekend, but it only managed a $44 million opening. However, those international audiences ate this thing up, which allowed Zilla to make $379 million worldwide. And yeah, I know this version of Godzilla gets a lot of hate, and it deserves it. Matthew Broderick does just fine. It's kind of interesting to see, like, a nerd get thrown into a action hero scenario. But yeah, this one has gone down in infamy as, you know, being really bad. But the animated series is actually surprisingly good for what it is. But Matthew Broderick had nothing to do with that, so why am I talking about it? I don't know, I just thought I should. Then came the year 1999, the greatest year for movies ever, and one of those great movies was Election, where we would see Matthew Broderick on the other side of the student-teacher relationship, opposite Reese Witherspoon. Election is directed by master filmmaker Alexander Payne, and it is genuinely hilarious. A frickin' brilliant script. Unfortunately, it only made $17 million when it was released, but this film has gone on to be highly respected, with Entertainment Weekly naming it one of the 50 best high school movies ever made, even though Election is like so much more than just a high school movie. It's a brilliant, dark, twisted tale about the human condition that just happens to take place in a high school. Did I mention it's hilarious too? And casting Ferris Bueller as the teacher is 
perfect. It shows how much this actor has grown and that he, you know, can do more. Even though director Alexander Payne said that he has never seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off. He just really admires the acting skills of Matthew Broderick. He would follow that up with the big screen adaptation of Inspector Gadget. Also in 1999, the best year for movies ever, but not because of Inspector Gadget. This film was a bomb and all those producers lost millions and millions and millions and millions of buckaroos. Even as a child in 1999, I thought that the casting of Matthew was always a bit off to me. I had watched the cartoons and then when I saw the poster and the trailer, I was like, him? But you know, whatever, Matthew tries his best. And after the great disappointment that was Inspector Gadget, Matthew was kind of done with the movies. At least for a while. It was time for him to get back to his theater roots with roles on Broadway in the productions of Night Must Fall and Taller Than a Dwarf. However, in 2001, he would take on the role that would earn him his most widespread acclaim and a Tony nomination that he would lose to his co-star, Nathan Lane, for the stage adaptation of Mel Brooks' hit film, The Producers. He would play Leopold Bloom in the play as well as the 2005 big screen adaptation. However, the movie was kind of a disappointment. The material was far more suited for the stage, even though it's based off of a movie. And audiences only showed up to the producers to a tune of $38 million off a $45 million budget. So yeah, the producers actually was a failure, which if they were doing the producers scheme means it was a success, so yay! Oh! But yeah, all the praise he got from the producers must have reignited his passion for the theater, as he would go on to appear in 16 more plays over the years, including highly acclaimed performances in the Broadway productions of The Odd Couple, The Philanthropist, nice work if you can get it, Sylvia, Oh Hello on Broadway, as a guest, Evening at the Talk House in 2017, and the latest one, Neil Simon's Plaza Suite currently running at the famed Hudson Theater on Broadway, get your tickets now, where he stars opposite his wife of 25 years, Sarah Jessica Parker. I love it when things go full circle. Matthew got his start in a Neil Simon production back in the 80s, and he's doing another Neil Simon right now in the 2020, 2022s. And seeing him alongside his wife, it's just, it's just so nice. Look at that. The stage loves you, Matthew. And so does Sarah Jessica Parker. We thank you and we love you. Thank you. Broderick has had a great balancing act with his career. In addition to his plentiful stage work, he was also getting lots of guest starring roles on several popular TV shows, such as 30 Rock, Modern Family, BoJack Horseman, Roseanne, I mean the Connors, Saturday Night Live, Rick and Morty, and Better Things, while still doing the occasional movie, such as the 2006 not quite Christmas classic, Deck the Halls, opposite Danny DeVito, and the Helen Hunt directorial debut, Then She Found Me. While he would finish out the decade with roles in The Stepford Wives in 2004, Jerry Seinfeld's B Movie in 2007, Diminished Capacity in 2008, Finding Amanda, also in 2008, and The Tale of Desperu. He would kick off the next decade by starring in the $9,000 grossing Wonderful World in 2010, followed by a film called Margaret in 2011, directed by his old high school friend, Kenneth Lonergan. Then they would squeeze Matthew into the cast of Tower Heist alongside many comedy legends. Critics called it Fun Fluff followed by some cameos in New Year's Eve, playing the tongue-in-cheek character Mr. Bullerton, and Trainwreck, playing himself. Then in 2016, he would reunite with his high school buddy, Kenneth Lonergan, for the extremely emotional and powerful, possibly one of the saddest movies ever, Manchester by the Sea, where Matthew Broderick and the rest of the cast would receive a Screen Actors Guild Award nomination for outstanding performance by a cast in a motion picture. That's some prestigious work there, Matthew. 
While these past few years you would be more likely to find Matthew Broderick appearing on the stage in New York or London, he has still managed to keep up appearances in films, like in 2016's American Side and Warren Beatty's Rules Don't Apply, 2018's To Dust, Wonder Park, in 2019, Love is Blind, also in 2019, and something called Lazy Susan in 2020. So yeah, he's still out there, working his butt off to entertain us peasants. But nothing the size of Godzilla anymore, which is probably a good thing. Mr. Matthew was never meant to be that kind of leading man. His skills belong where his heart is, his true love, the stage, and his true love Sarah Jessica Parker. And yet, 25 years married, and you know, in Hollywood years, that equals forever. It's a complicated... It was? I don't remember. We were not good at talking about this part. This is the part we don't talk about. Matthew Broderick will probably forever be known as Ferris Bueller, which is fine by him. But he has also carved out a career playing vastly different characters, and his stage work is the stuff of legend. He made headlines early in his career for both his talent and a tragic accident. But he was able to bounce back, and has been one of the most reliable movie stars of the past 30 years. He's one of those actors that you just smile when you see him pop up on the screen. You're like, oh yeah, Matthew's in this. Everything's gonna be all right. Sarah Jessica Parker said herself that she is very proud of the man that Ferris Bueller grew up to be. And here at the Joe Blow Movie Network, so are we. So nobody should give a fuck about what the fuck happened to Matthew Broderick because he's doing just fine. It's over. Go home. He's the ultimate regular dude who always seems to find himself in a wacky situation or an incredible adventure. Steve Gutenberg is the type of movie star that could only exist in the 80s and part of the 90s. He's a non-threatening nice guy with a charming sense of humor who always seems to find an excuse to take off his shirt. Gutenberg is the type of actor who provides exactly what is needed for the film and the character. No more, no less. He's an icon, a symbol of a more simple time when everyone could get together and laugh at police officers, the elderly, and three men, and a baby, and a g -g 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 ghost. And his moment at the top did not last very long, but he made the most of it. Hollywood just can't seem to find a place for this type of actor anymore, but the Sci-Fi Channel sure knows what to do with him. Well, I, I think about quitting show business five times a day um, because it's just a horrible grind. Um, but yeah, did Steve Gutenberg quietly step down from his throne, naturally and peacefully moving on with his life and his career? Or is there a more dark and sinister reason for why Stevie Boy stepped away from the silver screen? Probably not. But let's find out anyway, as we ask the question that's been on everybody's mind since that dog fell in love with that dolphin. What the f*** happened to Steve Gutenberg? That's a stupid question. One question, answer that. It's irrelevant, I won't answer it. Before we begin, I just want to say thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget to click that bell to get notifications if you're into this kind of stuff. Now, back to the show. But to truly understand what the fuck happened to Steve Gutenberg, we must begin at the beginning, and the beginning began when he was born on his birthday. 1958, Brooklyn, New York. The acting bug would take a big bite out of young Steven in high school. He was greatly inspired by his drama teacher, Mr. Kirby. He would venture off to Los Angeles and from 1977 to 1980, Steve Gutenberg would work the grind of any up-and-coming actor, filling out his resume with many commercials, advertising all sorts of wonderful material possessions. He had an uncredited role in a movie called Roller Coaster in 1977, as well as starring in a movie called Chicken Chronicles. In addition to appearing in a short-lived sitcom called No Soap Radio, 
And Steve Gutenberg claims that he learned how to be humble by working with Sir Lawrence Olivier in the film Boys from Brazil in 1978. <laughs> After appearing in a movie called Players in 1979 and a Village People movie called Can't Stop the Music in 1980, Steve Gutenberg would appear in the incredible ensemble cast in Barry Livingston's directorial debut, Diner. Critics were very impressed with the performances in this film, saying that it felt like the actors had known each other for years, like they weren't acting. This film about friendship has maintained its popularity over the years, with the American Film Institute raking it number 57 on its 100 Funniest Films Ever Made list. And of course, Steve Gutenberg fits right into this perfect cast. Oh, Modell, you're really, really getting me mad now. You, my blood is boiling. Gentlemen, I'll take a sandwich. No, okay. don't! Fine, I'll take the sandwich. See, see what you do every... He was part of a nuclear holocaust TV movie spectacular the day after in 1983. Then the following year, Steve Gutenberg would headline the film that launched a million sequels, Police Academy, in 1984. Picking up where the Keystone Cops left off, continuing the comedic tradition of funny cops into the annals of cinema. In interviews, Steve Gutenberg says that he didn't try to play the character for anything more than what he was. A party guy who doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. Nothing more, nothing less. Police Academy would go on to become the sixth highest grossing film in 1984, making close to 150 million worldwide off a four and a half million dollar budget. Be back in five minutes! Yes, sir. Shit, I'm deaf. Gutenberg would return to the role of Officer Mahoney for three more adventures. 1985's Their First Assignment, 1986 Back in Training, and 1987's Citizens on Patrol. However, scheduling conflicts with other films would keep him from reprising his role. He was in a Sally Field Michael Caine movie called Surrender, and around this time he would star in the Ron Howard classic film Cocoon. Gutenberg absolutely loved this script about aliens who make old people feel young in a magic pool. He loved it so much that he worked for less than his usual fee. Gutenberg really believed in this project. And he believed in its 1988 sequel, Cocoon, The Return, where I'm assuming the cocoons return. Uh. The same year that Cocoon came out, 1985, he was in a movie called Bad Medicine, and the next year, 1986, he was in the now classic Short Circuit, which made over $40 million at the box office off a $15 million budget. But Roger Ebert, the guy with the thumbs, was not a big fan of this one, saying that Short Circuit is too cute for its own good. And there was a sequel in 1988, but Gutenberg wasn't in that one, so let's move on. Number five! <laughs> In the late 80s, it was getting about time for Steve Gutenberg to try his hand at more darker material. He'd make his way over into the thriller genre with 1987's The Bedroom Window, but he would still continue to bring the laughs by appearing in Amazon Women on the Moon. The year 1987 would see Steve Gutenberg appear alongside Tom Selleck and Ted Danson in this Spock-directed Massive hit comedy, Three Men and a Baby. This comedy was the highest grossing American film of 1987, making 240 million worldwide off an 11 million dollar budget. Three Men and a Baby remains Steve Gutenberg's highest grossing film to date. And perhaps it was that ghost in the window that helped propel this film to such great heights. You know, like Steve's pal Casper. As many of you know, there's a behind-the-scenes urban legend of Three Men and a Baby that just over an hour into the film, you can see the ghost of a boy who died in the house where it was filmed. However, that was allegedly debunked, as the film was shot on a soundstage, and the ghost was really a cardboard standee of Ted Danson that was accidentally left on set. Yeah, they want us to believe that. Yeah, right. Critics found that the film Three Men and a Baby 
mainly worked because the three leads had such great chemistry. Uh, a headache. You're giving me a headache. Uh, how about, uh, how about this? How about this? Look at this. Look at a hairy chest. You like that? You like that? You want, you want one of these? And that cast would reunite a few years later for the $71 million grossing sequel, Three Men and a Little Lady. After his ghostly experience on Three Men and a Baby, he would go on to do another movie with ghosts in it called High Spirits in 1988. It's a wacky fantasy flick where he gets romantic with the dead, but in a fun, silly, 80s kind of way. Oh, and we can't forget the movie Don't Tell Her It's Me, aka The Boyfriend School, which had him sporting a New Zealand accent and a mullet. Then he took a few years off from the big screen to go back to his stage roots, to work on a few Broadway productions, because despite what some may say, he's actually like a real actor, a thespian, an artiste. But Steve Gutenberg would come roaring back to the big screen by playing more mature roles in films aimed at younger audiences, such as his role in the Disney soccer underdog flick, The Big Green. And he joined the ensemble cast of the Christmas film Home for the Holidays, as well as star in the Parent Trap ripoff Olsen Twins movie, It Takes Two. But he got the ultimate seal of stardom when he was mentioned in one of the best Simpsons episodes ever, the Stonecutters episode, in the song We Do, which perfectly pokes fun at Gutenberg's status as an unlikely superstar. You know, the only explanation for this guy's popularity is that an Illuminati-like organization put him there, LOL. Who makes you Gutenberg a star? But for me, growing up in the 90s, there was no better Steve Gutenberg movie the 1997's Tower of Terror. It was made for ABC's Sunday Night Wonderful World of Disney, and was based off the popular theme park ride. And one has to wonder, is Steve's decision to star in a film about ghosts in Hollywood his subtle, secretive, symbolic way of telling us the truth behind the phantom of three men and a baby? Most likely, definitely, yes, maybe. Redemption. It'll get me back in the game. People will listen to me again. And seriously, what do I care about some moldy old ghosts? I don't even know. With the 90s coming to a close, Steve Gutenberg would star in one last wide theatrical release, a movie called Zeus and Roxanne, where a dog falls in love with a dolphin. However, Zeus and Roxanne only managed to make 7.2 million at the box office. Zeus and Roxanne. Available everywhere videos are sold. And from then on, good old Goots would take his talents directly to video. Kicking things off with a kind of prequel to Casper, called Casper, a spirited beginning. And even the biggest Casper fans hate this fucking movie. He tried to be an action hero in 1998's Airborne. He tried to be a race car driver in Overdrive also in 1998, and he would try again at the underdog soccer thing again in Home Team, also, also in 1998. From there, good old Gutenberg would spend the next 20 years starring in over 40 direct-to-video or extremely limited released titles. Films like P.S. Your Cat Is Dead, the TV movie remake of The Poseidon Adventure, Jessica Simpson's Private Valentine, Blonde and Dangerous, At the Top of the Pyramid, Les Bomb, I Love You, and its sequel, I Love You Too. <laughs> and Gutenberg did get stuck in that Hallmark Christmas movie mode with two films, Single Santa Seeks Miss Claus and Meet the Santas. Steve Gutenberg, Crystal Bernard, Hey, Mr. Claus! But while Gutenberg was making some questionable film choices, he was also bringing some of that 80s nostalgia to our TV screens. He would be featured on popular TV shows such as Veronica Mars, The Goldbergs, Law and Order, Criminal Intent, Community, and Ballers. 
as well as appearing as himself on such shows like According to Jim, also playing himself in Party Down, and playing himself again again in The Mysteries of Laura, as well as being a contestant on Season 6 of Dancing with the Stars, where he was eliminated on the show's third episode. OMG. But Steve Gutenberg would fully embrace that sci-fi channel corny movie trend with a movie called Lava Lantula. You know, it's like volcano spiders, basically. It reunites him with some of his Police Academy castmates and got a sequel to Lava to Lantula. And in this beloved Lava Lantula franchise, he plays an aging actor who doesn't know what to do with his career and is the world's only chance at stopping these volcano spider things. And I don't know if you know this, but Lava Lantula exists in the same cinematic universe as Sharknado. You know what? This shows that Steve Gutenberg still likes to have a good time. Movies should be fun. And the first step to making a movie fun is casting a guy who seems like he's having fun. And whether it's Diner, Three Men and a Baby, Police Academy, or Lava Lantula, or Two Lava, Two Lantula, Steve is always having fun, which is totally contagious. Viva Los Angelinos! Lava Lantula, a sci-fi original movie. He was featured on Holy Moly in 2020, played a very interesting looking character in a film called Original Gangster in 2021, and appeared in Paper Empire in 2022. Hey, that's this year. So you know what? He's still working. He's still out there doing his thing. And Steve Gutenberg has other projects in the works. And there's rumors out there that Disney is working on a Three Men and a Baby sequel. Sequel? Three Men and a Bride? Because that baby's old enough to get married now. So yeah, those rumors are starting to stir up again, so maybe there's a comeback just around the corner. But you know what? He doesn't really need one. His legacy is secure. In Steve Gutenberg's 2012 memoir, The Gutenberg Bible, he opens this book by recalling his first conversation he had with an agent at the age of 16. The agent told him to forget about being an actor, telling him that he doesn't have the right look, didn't have the talent, and his name was ridiculous. Gutenberg. Nearly one billion dollars in box office receipts later, Steve Gutenberg has gotten the last laugh. Some movie stars may head down dark paths when their careers start to mellow out, but Gutenberg has never really been tangled up in any controversy. He lives a humble life with his wife. Gutenberg is involved in several charities, and the people who have known and worked with him over the years have nothing but nice things to say about the guy. So maybe what they say is true. Nice guys do finish last. But that's okay, because it's the journey that truly matters. And Gutenberg sure gave us quite the adventure along the way. He has his own production company now, and he even named it after his old high school drama teacher, Mr. Kirby Productions. Relax. Relax, right? Relax. Om, om. Gutenberg had his time in the spotlight, and that was plenty. He never burnt out or disgracefully ruined his legacy or annoyed us with too many Gutenbergian performances. You know, to the point where we don't really appreciate him anymore. We were given just enough. Hollywood just kind of kept moving on, and Steve Gutenberg was like, oh, okay, thanks for the fun times. I'm just gonna keep doing my thing. Steve Gutenberg seems to know his place in the history of cinema and in the zeitgeist of our pop culture. He's never trying to be something he's not, always staying true to himself. And Steve seems to really appreciate the opportunities that he's had in his career. He loves that so many of his films have become classics, but he always humbly never takes credit for their timeless appeal. He's the perfect example of not knowing what you got until it's gone. We didn't truly appreciate what we had when he was around. You know, it's happened to us all. One day you wake up and you just think, hey, you know what? Steve Gutenberg isn't in movies anymore. I miss him. And you know what? That is the genius of Gutenberg. Leaving you wanting more. And nobody, not nobody can do it like Steve. So, nobody, not nobody should give a fuck about what the fuck happened to Steve Gutenberg. Because he's doing just fine.